I'm honored uh, to be in your midst today. Creatives are probably the only occupational group that still have a reputation left in our world today. And the simple reason, the simple reason is that they don't really allow anyone to put them in a box. So, you know, they can always escape. They can be anything they like at any time. Lawyers, for example, my profession, are the most maligned. Yeah. Descriptions ranging from scorpions to sharks and all that. And of course, politicians are the scum of the earth. <laughs> so, so what sort of image would a lawyer politician like myself have? I, I really, frankly, blame no one for my lot, you know, except probably my mom. And I really uh, might have been a modestly successful poet, but for the most traumatic incident that happened when I was about 10 years old, there was a girl in my class who I was quite certain at the time that I could give my life for. <laughs> so I wrote her a lovely poem uh, over a weekend, you know. I wrote the poem on Friday and finished it on Saturday. And if it was, if I may say so myself, a work of sheer genius. <laughs> it ended with the dramatic words, your warm embrace may be the last desire of my heart before I die. Well, there are those, uh, of course, uh, there are those here who might think that, well, there isn't much, uh, you know, not much rhythm in that, but anyway. <laughs> I talked it in my school bag and looked forward with a heart filled with love for Monday to present it to the object of my affections. My mom, while cleaning out the bag, <laughs> found the letter and all hell broke loose. I did as to say she beat the poetic genius out of me. <laughs> that terrible, that terrible, terrible afternoon. But that's not the end of the story. True love, as you know, will survive even the worst brutality. So I bore my injuries as a worthy suffering for my beloved. On Monday morning, I found the best opportunity to give her a freshly written version of the poem. <laughs> I walked away and turned away as she read it. I didn't want to behold the sheer pleasure that this poem would give her. But as I, was, as I turned around, I noticed that she had actually handed the poem over to the teacher. <laughs> and she was pointing at me. While, while my physical bruises have healed from that experience, from, as you can imagine, what happened with the teacher, my capacity for writing romantic poetry has been greatly diminished. <laughs> Fantastical Futures is the audaciously inspirational theme of this iteration of the Ake Book Festival. Why do we in today's world dare to hope for a future so fantastic that it can be described as fantastical? The reason is, if I may offer one, that there is, for those who have cast this great vision, Lola and her friends and collaborators, they have not allowed their vision to be beclouded by the cataracts of discouragement that so easily beset us. Two of those cataracts to our vision are worthy of mention. The first is a disdain for introspection, which has just come over time. That capacity for deep thought, and making that the basis of planning and action. It's a disdain for introspection that causes our elite to spend or embezzle all the cash and opportunities of the present, and make it the burden of a leaner future to pay for our corruption and carelessness. A failure to interrogate the past, coupled with a reluctance to explain the benefit of deferring gratification, is a creative 
also sometimes unable to stick to a cause because it may no longer be popular. Nii Oshundari, a poet I'm sure that we're all familiar with, Nii Oshundari, captures this elite inability to defer gratification in a provocative poem entitled Eating Tomorrow's Yam. And I quote a portion of it. He said, there is only one left in the village barn. The prodigal calls for a knife. What shall we eat tomorrow, the people ask. If we finish all the yam today, just how shall we feel when the downhill has relieved stomachs of their improvident burden? And says the prodigal, quote, tomorrow will take care of itself. How can we know the next day if we die of hunger today? The recursive one step forward, two step backwards of our histories, especially in Africa, has caused Professor Tanure Ojaide, and I'm sure you're all familiar with him as well, in his angry style to ask, what poets do our leaders read? Again, uh, Ojaide in his poem, No Longer Our Country, remonstrates, and I quote him, we have lost it, the country we were born into. We can now sing dirges of the Commonwealth only of yesterday. We have a country that is no longer our own. But even he, that is Ojaide, will agree that societies are built by men and women, not spirits. Which leads me to the second cataract that blurs our vision. And that is the failure to recognize the responsibility of the individual, especially the gifted individual. Does the artist have a responsibility to society beyond that of the ordinary citizen? Is there a civic tax, a civic tax payable on talent? Does the fact of your genius place upon you a moral burden to attempt to use the powerful voice of your art to fight for the soul of the land, especially to fight for the soul of the land from whence you came, to take moral positions? Are you, by virtue of your intellect and creativity, a moral agent, or are you not? Can you afford to be neutral? Can you be politically neutral? Can you, in the face of so much that needs to be done, poverty, deprivation, injustice, stay politically neutral? Can Africa afford to have its best talents wearing halos of political innocence and saying, let us leave politics to the scoundrels? There is a growing impatience of the deprived millions of our people with the elite, which includes all of us in this room. The bombs tied to the 11-year-old body of Safiatu, a malnourished girl who has never been to school, cannot distinguish between a lawyer like Yemi Oshibayu or a writer like Malara Wood. The bombs do not discriminate. But two things before I take my seat, and one is in response to uh, Lola, who asked for some kind of policy group for uh, for creatives. Earlier this year, the government established the Technology and Creativity Sector Working Group, a policy committee of federal government ministers and heads of agencies with creatives, tech and entertainment business owners. The group meets to work on policy, including rules and regulations regularly. So we do have now a policy group which takes into account the sorts of views that creatives may want, especially in formulating policy. And that is so for technology, uh, uh, persons in technology as well. So I think that there is plenty of room for expression, especially the way that we want to see policies shaped that could affect uh, creatives, that, that could affect those involved in technology. The last, before I say it, is that did you enjoy the story I told earlier? Yeah. It was fiction. <laughs> I wish you all, I wish you all a fantastic future. Thank you.